Hi, everybody. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you for coming and welcome to the webinar today on being back on campus. We will get started in just a moment. Thanks everyone for joining us. I still see a lot of um, people joining the webinar, so I wanna give folks a chance to sign on, uh, join us, and we'll get started in just a minute. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for taking the time out um, and for attending this webinar. We have um, actually a little bit more than an hour reserved for this. We wanna make sure we have time for a Q&A conversation um, at the end of the presentation. So thank you for joining us. My name is Emma Stocker and I'm the Director of Emergency Management at Portland State and one of the facilitators of the Campus Incident Management Team. Today, I get to facilitate this webinar focusing on being back on campus. Portland State is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon in Multnomah County. It's important that we honor the indigenous peoples whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wadlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River or wherever you are today. We must acknowledge the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Today, we have a panel of campus leaders here to answer your questions. We hope today's webinar provides you with information that you need to feel more comfortable being on campus. Just as a reminder, this webinar is geared towards an employee audience. There was a webinar focusing on student-related topics earlier this week, and a recording of that can be found online. Our presentation today covers a lot of topics, as you can see on the agenda. Most of the slides that we have for you identify websites where you can find more detail, and we can get into more detail during the Q&A as well. We do have the live Q&A function enabled for this Zoom webinar. You will see that button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. The panelists and other campus administrators will actively respond to Q&A throughout the webinar. And you are welcome at any time to email questions to coronavirusresponse at pdx.edu. <clears throat> You'll also notice at the bottom of your Zoom screen a button for live closed captioning. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on PSU's COVID-19 response website, along with some of the Q&A from today to view later. In this presentation, we plan to talk about what it means to be back on campus, policies in place to support the well-being of our community, how on-campus cases of COVID are managed, resources for employees, and some of the nuts and bolts, the nuts and bolts logistics of being on campus. So with all of that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Walsh, the Associate Vice Provost and Dean of Student Life. Mike? Well, thanks a lot, Emma. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Walsh, Dean of Student Life. He, his, him pronouns. And I just want to welcome you as well to this webinar. And I wanted to start off by saying and acknowledging that it's just, it's been a very difficult 18 months for all of us and also for all of our students. And that this transition is going to take some time logistically and emotionally and and we've been doing this remote environment for 18 months. And so making that transition is, is gonna be very difficult, but it's also gonna be very engaging. Uh, and you're gonna learn more about safety and other issues in this webinar, but I do wanna just start off by saying that um, PSU has worked very hard to make this the safest educational environment possible. Uh, and so you may ask questions like, why, why now? Why come back now? 
Uh, the time is now because our students need us. And in uh, surveys of our students, we've seen that over half of our students report um, that remote learning challenged their academic success. In fact, 64% of our students said that remote learning provided barriers to their academic success that they did not expect. Um, it also diminishes their sense of belonging at PSU and has contributed to mental health and other life challenges. Uh, and essentially, the in-person experience brings those students back into our caring community uh, where they can access the services and support that they need. You know, as, as we all know, it's all about students first, right? And that includes uh, connection and community. Uh, it includes care and engagement. And it includes especially uh, an equity lens on everything we do. Uh, our students are going to be present on campus, uh, and so it's vital to them that we are also present with them. Indeed, the most important aspect of education is presence for each other. Thanks for being here. I'll pass it back off to Emma. Thank you, Mike, for grounding us in the student experience. We, as Mike said, we have worked very hard to keep our community healthy. We've learned a lot about COVID-19, how it spreads, what we can do. And that is why we have implemented a range of public health measures, including a vaccine requirement, a mask requirement, and improved airflow and ventilation in our buildings. Nathan Klinkhammer, Associate Vice President of Human Resources, is here with an update on the vaccine policy. Nathan? Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Nathan Klinkhammer, he is him. Um, the vaccination policy is in effect now for fall term and beyond. Um, this is important to you because this is a requirement to work, uh, to be eligible to work on campus. And so many of us, most of us, I would say, have jobs that require a presence on the PSU campus. And the vaccination policy is what enables that. Uh, there are exemptions available for both medical and non-medical reasons. Um, if you, uh, the place to start with this is VanWeb. If you go to VanWeb, you can perform that attestation. You can also be directed to the appropriate exemption forms and upload documentation as needed. Current vaccination rate for the PSU community is over 90%, uh, specifically for faculty and staff. 97%. Uh, you can find this information is available online and is updated on a weekly basis. Uh, if you look on the homepage for PSU, you'll see that COVID-19, COVID, COVID uh, drop down at the top. It's one of the primary links. And there is a COVID dashboard under there as well. Just a reminder to folks that vaccination status is personal information. Uh, we shouldn't ask about it the same way that we shouldn't ask for details about a colleague's medical conditions and employees should never feel a need to disclose their vaccination status or any other medical conditions to their colleagues uh, again as this is reflected out to supervisors uh, it is on the dashboard for your teams and it is shown as either eligible to work on campus meaning that there is compliance with that vaccination policy or not eligible to work on campus and based on whether the job is necessary on campus, um, there are conversations that would have to occur there. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Nathan. It is encouraging that we have such a high vaccination rate in our campus community, um, higher than many of the communities around us. Um, masking is also another important public health measure. And to speak to that topic, we have Brian Roy, Associate Vice President of risk management and contracting. Brian? Thanks, Emma. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to talk about masks, uh, why we're doing using them, and what to expect on campus this fall. So uh, what we know is masking is incredibly effective uh, at reducing the spread of uh, COVID. Uh, it's something that's been pretty durable during this entire pandemic. And it's something that we haven't changed. Uh, you know, we saw it over the summer. Uh, reduction in masking uh, guidelines across our community. And we maintain our mask requirements indoors. And we're gonna have masking for all people indoors in this fall, unless you're in a uh, contained space by yourself in an office with a closed door, for instance. Other than that, everyone inside needs to be wearing a mask. And then outside, we ask that people wear masks when they're in crowded settings, settings where they can't be distant from one another. 
Um, these are um, the same types of uh, mandates and requirements that we're seeing in our community. It aligns with the state mask guidelines right now. Uh, now we know that people um, are have questions about masking. Uh, one, we do have clear masks available for instructors. Uh, we have quite uh, quite a large supply of those available for instruction. Some instructors might find that easy. Uh, some people have uh, disabilities, which may make it necessary to use. Um, masks are also available at all building entrances. Um, those are disposable masks, uh, if you forget it or if you need an extra one. Uh, what does enforcement look like for this? Well, um, we're asking that people help out in that if they're comfortable. If they see somebody without a mask, please just remind that person. If you're not comfortable with it, that's always acceptable. Um, we do have a, a mass policy violation report form. The link here is on this uh, slide so that people can let us know if they have concerns about mask usage around campus. Our student safety ambassadors are gonna be walking around campus in shared spaces, reminding people to wear masks and helping to make sure that people comply. Um, we are allowing uh, eating and drinking on campus um, as before. And while you're actively eating and drinking, you can remove your mask. But we do ask people be diligent and when they're not actively eating and drinking to put the mask back on. Um, eating and drinking is not allowed in classrooms. It will be 100% mask usage in classrooms for this fall term. Emma? Thanks, Brian. And I wanna assure everyone that um, Brian is a real person. I think the lighting in uh, his space is actually outside made it so that um, it looked sort of just like a talking cutout, but um, he is, he is real and he is with us. <laughs> I couldn't see myself. I apologize. I'm uh, scrambling on my end. So sorry. I hope at least I sounded clear. Yes, loud and clear. Thanks, Brian. Somebody asked in the chat, where can um, faculty or employees obtain a clear mask or other masks? So I just wanted to add at this time, um, you can find the link to the supply request form on the COVID-19 um, websites. So that is up. There is a mask um, page. There's a dedicated page for masking, and we'll get that link actually put into the um, chat right now. So you all should find that and be able to link to it and um, work with your departments to get a request for masks together. So some of the questions that were submitted in advance of the webinar by you who are attending today were about the health and safety in the physical environment, specifically air quality. So we wanted to speak to that. Heather Randall, Director of Facilities and Property Management, is here to walk us through these various measures for the physical environment. Heather? Thank you very much, Emma. As Emma said, I'm Heather Randall, she, her pronouns. And I'm sharing today that across campus, we've upgraded filters in our ventilation systems wherever possible with MERV 13 filters, which you may have heard of. They are industry best practice for reducing potential exposure to COVID in indoor air conditioned spaces. Another best practice is to include as much outdoor air as possible in the mix that goes through our ventilation systems. And we've made adjustments across campus to do just that, introduce as much outside air as possible. In addition to these steps, there are portable HEPA filter units in classrooms and spaces across campus where they are most effective, which tend to be slightly smaller spaces where multiple people are gathered at a time. And to find out what the status is in your own building, there are links associated with the coronavirus response web pages, including this environmental health and safety page noted at the bottom specifically about indoor air quality for more information. Back to you, Emma. Thank you, Heather. So next, we want to share some information about what happens when someone on campus tests positive for COVID-19. What is our case response program? We'll cover three main topics, contact tracing, notifications, and quarantine. Mark Bajoric, Director of Health Services at the Center for Student Health and Counseling is here to talk with us about that. Before I hand it over to Mark, I just have to say, a huge thank you to all of the staff at SHAC. The entire team there has been 
absolutely invaluable in supporting students and employees through this whole pandemic with questions, um, talking about symptoms, helping with testing, and it's really been an invaluable piece of our response. So with that, Mark, can you join us uh, and talk about um, COVID-19 contact tracing? Sure, I'd be happy to. So when, I guess, the first place to start is if you're sick, stay at home. I think in the past, we've been encouraging employees, faculty, staff, students to power through illness. Not so much anymore. Um, people have had leave time. Um, they've been able to call us about, well, my test was positive. When was I contagious? And we uh, try to sort that out. We're encouraging visitors to the university, employees, students, and other people associated with the university to register their positive tests because what happens after that, a student, excuse me, a nurse reaches out to that person and finds out exactly what type of test was done to determine that they're COVID positive, and then when they might have been infectious. Based on um, the infectious piece, then we sort out who they might have been exposed to more than 15 minutes within a six foot radius. That information about that the individual's building use is shared so that an OSHA letter goes out and probably many of you have seen those OSHA letters like you've been on campus, there was somebody that had a positive test, work with SHAC on getting testing. We provide counseling at SHAC, we provide the testing at SHAC and we provide vaccination for students, we use the Moderna vaccine. In addition, we would review the report from the past week to create a dashboard that's sent out and is on the university COVID website. Another, um, well, for about 12 months, we didn't have many students on campus, but over the summer, we had the experience of what it's like to problem solve when a student is positive and has been in a classroom. In that case, I talked to the instructor and sort out, did was it a full class? Was it just part of the class? Can they speak to that? Did the class even meet? And after that, a letter is sent to the students saying, hey, if you're vaccinated, it's this protocol. Hey, if you're unvaccinated, it's this protocol. Not everybody is a close contact. We have to look at where they were, how long they were there, and other exposure factors. We really enjoy when employees, students call us because sometimes the concerns that that individual has might not mirror every other employee or every other student. We uh, give information to housing as well as athletics regarding isolation and regarding quarantine. And so just so that we're all speaking the same language, if someone is exposed to an individual that's positive, but say, that person that was already the um, exposed person has been vaccinated, they would still spend some time wearing a mask. Unfortunately, if someone is exposed to an individual who is COVID positive and is not vaccinated, that person needs to quarantine. And lastly, if someone becomes COVID positive and has a COVID positive test result, those folks are thought to be in isolation. So I, I hope that spells out a little bit about um, our notification process. It's really important that we work with employees about quarantine because that helps control the spread of the virus. We know that people who have been vaccinated, about 20% can still catch the virus. So it's important that even if you're vaccinated, that you wear a mask, that you get tested in three to five days to make sure that you're not spreading the Delta variant or another variant on campus. It's also important, people have reasons why they haven't gotten vaccinated. And so we encourage those people, if they have been exposed, please get tested right away, go into quarantine. That means not being around anybody and continue to wear your mask. And then we can retest you seven days after your exposure to again, see if there's a possibility that you are COVID positive. We encourage people to, to stay away from campus if they have a cough, if they have a fever, if they have sneezing, if they lose their sense of smell. If you want, there's also additional information that's available online regarding questions of 
notification and quarantine. Thanks for this time, Emma. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. One of the pieces I want to um, reiterate about notifications is that um, the way that we conduct the um, email notifications, not the contact tracing notifications, but the email notifications to the building is that we do use card swipe data to understand who has been in the building to let them know that there was someone else in the building that, um, that tested positive for COVID. Again, this is not likely a close contact situation, but it's a reminder why it's so important that you have your PSU ID card with you and that you swipe into the buildings when you are entering. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. I wanna move us on now to uh, supporting employees. We have Shelly Shabone, Vice President of Academic Personnel and Leadership Development. Jared Thomas, Senior Director of Academic Technology Services, and Nathan Klinkhammer back with us to talk about resources and policies we have in place to support our employees. Shelly, we'll start with you. OAA, we know, has been hard at work developing resources for instructors. Can you tell us about a few of the things that have been created recently um, and are available now? Yes, thanks, Emma, and thanks to each of the attendees for taking the time to engage in today's discussion. We recognize that this academic year will present new challenges, and we hope that by continuing to support each other, we can also discover new opportunities for growth and for joy. Cindy Bacar and I are here on behalf of OAA to offer our support and guidance, and to be sure you are aware of the resources and materials that Emma just referenced and that are available to assist you over the next few weeks and months. In response to your suggestions, we have created a new OAA website with tools, videos, and a guide. I believe the URL will be uh, placed in the chat shortly if uh, it has not uh, been already placed there. Uh, the guide covers several scenarios you might experience in your classroom, ranging from issues around requests for accommodations or adjustments, responding to cases of COVID, managing the use of masks, and so forth. We've also developed a, a syllabus statement uh, so that you can establish and clarify the university expectations. It's highly recommended that faculty insert this statement in their syllabi and review it with their students on the first day of class. The Dean of Student Life, who you've heard from, Mike Walsh, has a mask enforcement video in which he describes a five-step process for addressing a student who comes to class without a mask or who takes their mask off in class. And importantly, we want you to know that we will continue to update and add to these resources regularly. Finally, we have upgraded the technology in our classrooms and have a new classroom technology page. And Jared Thomas is here to talk about this classroom technology. Jared. Thanks, Shelley. We've been hard at work uh, going around to the, all of the general pool classrooms for which we've installed some new Zoom classroom technology in. Our classrooms uh, still have the same technology that y'all are used to from before the pandemic. So there will be a projector, audio, uh, DVD player, and all the things you're used to, as well as a new secondary monitor and Zoom uh, touch panel that allows you to both record and or uh, stream your class to remote participants. Um, we basically have our four main types of classrooms. Our, our basic uh, mid-tech is, is our classic room, like I just described, the Zoom. And then there's a handful of distance learning classrooms and global classrooms, which are um, uh, have extra cameras and, and a little bit different miking. Um, most classes will all be held in the Zoom classrooms. And we, as Shelly mentioned, created a new landing page, which will pop in the chat here in a little bit. Uh, that gives you a bunch of information, gives you a little orientation uh, to that technology. Uh, we have had some 
questions for folks wanting to try the technology out uh, before the term starts. And uh, in FMH, in uh, KMC and Kramer Hall, the general pool rooms are unlocked and should be available. Uh, we also have a short list of rooms that are reserved specifically for folks to come do drop in, uh, playing around with the technology if you plan on trying some of that uh, during the fall session. So come on down to campus while it's uh, still not too busy if you want to just give it a try. There's lots of rooms open and we'll be posting that information in chat as well. And I think uh, next is uh, Nathan again. Terrific, thank you. Just some quick reminders here for folks about the resources that are available to you uh, as you come back to work in the fall. Of course, we have sick leave available. Uh, this is available to all employees. It's reported through BANWEB the same way that you would report any leave. Uh, the HR website does have some specific call out information available on it related to the usage of sick leave for you know, coverage in terms of COVID-19. And so I would encourage you to take a look at that. Primarily here for all of these resources, if you are sick, please do stay home. Along those lines, we have provided additional COVID-19 sick leave. This is a program that PSU put in place at the beginning of last year to continue with the federal guidelines, our mandate from the previous year. And the balances that you currently, that you previously had into the, in that program have rolled forward. They will be available through the end of the year. We're also going and adding up to an additional week of leave to those uh, to that sick leave balance up to two weeks total. And so uh, that will also be extended. That additional week of leave will be extended to new hires through this year as well. A reminder briefly on remote work arrangements uh, to be talking with your supervisor to coming to a schedule and uh, they can inform you of what, what the schedule will be and the remote work agreement codifies that and can be completed online electronically. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. So we'll move to our last section of slides now um, and then move into the Q&A. Um, I want to let folks know that we are moving as quickly as we can through the Q&A um, uh, function here in the Zoom webinar. We've gotten through almost 60 questions. There's more than 60 questions that, that folks have put in there. So if we haven't responded to your question quite yet, do know that we are working through that. And we'll also have a time um, for some back and forth here after the presentation. So the next section of slides is about being on campus and what that's like. Uh, from personal experience, even just this week, be, I know that being back on campus comes with a whole new set of logistics that maybe we are um, not as good with as we used to be. I was on campus this week and I forgot my ID card. I had to remember which streets were one-way streets and which ones um, were not. So um, it can be a challenge to get back into that rhythm. So we wanted to talk through some of those logistics to help your, to help your early days back on campus go as smoothly as possible. We have um, Chief of Campus Public Safety, Willie Halliburton here to share some details um, and reminders about campus safety and building access. Chief? Well, thank you, Emma. Uh, first of all, we're really excited here at CPSO for our community to return to campus. Uh, campus Public Safety Office has been open since the pandemic started. So we've been here for about a year and a half when it was a bare campus and we we're so looking forward to getting our students and our staff back here to uh, continue the fellowship. Uh, first of all, I'd like to announce that uh, Campus Public Safety began unarmed patrols uh, September 1st of this year, of 2021. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to the many men and women of Campus Public Safety who've assisted in um, creating policies, uh, building uh, this, this new form of police work, which I'm so proud that we're, we're able to do it. People doubted us, but we were able to do it, and it's only because of the patience of our campus here. With that said, I just want to remind uh, folks that uh, when we get back to campus, especially in the parking structures, make sure that you keep your valuables uh, out of plain sight in your cars, and make sure your car doors are locked because you know we've, we've experienced and continue to experience issues uh, with people breaking into cars. There, we're improving our camera system so that we can have a better monitor those areas uh, which we uh, have those issues. So remember, keep valuables uh, out of public sight in your cars. Um, another thing too, uh, a lot of instructors, faculty members, 
remember to lock your 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 doors to your offices. You know, a lot of people sometimes walk out and and just to go to different places throughout the building, but it's important that we continue to keep our property uh, in a safe manner by locking our doors. Uh, we talk about the our campus escort service, which is something that we really uh, sell to our students about being able to escort them to different places throughout the campus. But that's open to our uh, administration as well, our, our faculty as well. If you're in a class late at night, you wanna escort by a public safety officer to your vehicle in one of the parking structures, please give CPSO, CPSO a call and we have an officer there, again, to escort you to that, that location which you need. Our office is open 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, what I'm saying is that police patrols will be from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., but the uh, other campus public safety officers are here 24 hours a day. So we always have someone here. Our dispatch area is always available and open. So please give us a call if there's an issue. The telephone number is 725 4407 again 503 725 4407 and again our doors are always open we welcome you we want to build relationships with our community out there so our doors are open at, at all times thank you emma well let's talk about access control should we get into that now emma Since that I'm would be great here? thank you yep okay Okay, in order to reduce potential vectors for exposure to COVID-19 and to provide the institution the best possible tools for notifying community members of potential exposure, building access will be limited for members of our general public. And this is an unprecedented approach for PSU. We are anticipating that there may be some unforeseen challenges that require us to adjust our approach. We'll make every effort to provide notice and clear communication regarding any change that must be made. We ask for the community's help and understanding as we work out these potential issues. PSU ID cards will be required to access most facilities on campus. The current exceptions include ASRC, FMH, RMNC, and Vanport. SMSU will have public availability through the Broadway entrance. That's on the north that's east side. PSU ID cards that were dated to expire during the last 18 months have been extended to January 31st, 2022. Access to buildings included, is included automatically for all faculty, employees, and students. This includes buildings such as Miller Library, but only during uh, posted hours of operation. If you have any issues with your access, please contact your department's authorized access requester to have them submit a request to access control. If your access appears to have stopped working, please contact access control or CPSO dispatch. For any procedurals or log logistical concerns, please contact Michael McNerney, our physical security manager at michael.mcnerney at pdx.edu. I'm looking forward to seeing all of our, uh, our members back on campus here. And Emma, thank you again. Absolutely, thank you so much. We've gotten a few questions in the Q&A box and there were certainly several submitted in advance of the webinar about transportation and parking. And I can speak a little bit to that now. Um, so, there are several new options um, for, for parking permits on campus. There is a new part-time permit available, which is three fixed days a week and the weekends at a new price level there of 120 per month. Another change, um, we'll say on the transportation, thank you. So another change uh, is that parking structure three is now open to hourly, daily, and permit parkers. Additionally, the transit pass sales um, are available through to PSU, and there's a link on the transportation and parking website for that. The, um, just a reminder that parking permits for staff and faculty do not sell out. There are always spaces available. And the transportation and parking folks have a COVID specific website um, within their within their suite of websites, and we'll provide the link to that in the chat as well. You can find more out about those details or about other transportation options like bike registry, like carpool options, um, and things like that. So last but certainly not least, we'll get Heather back here. And we'll, Heather, if you would please share with us the current approach to cleaning on campus and supply requests. Thank you, Emma. As many of you know, we have wonderful partners in Relay Resources who clean our campus, and they have been here the entire time, keeping 
campus clean for folks who have been on site. And as operations return to more normal levels, so has, have our cleaning protocols. And their focus is on high touch surfaces, as well as all the standard cleaning that you would have expected pre-COVID, including classrooms on a nightly basis. In addition, we have hand sanitizer stations that have been installed and added in locations all across campus, including in all of our classrooms. We also have disinfectant wipes available in classrooms for your use as needed when you are in a classroom space for students to use when they enter a classroom if they want to wipe their desk down and so forth. Single use mask dispensers have also been installed near building entrances all across campus. And in non-classroom spaces, we also have the opportunity for departments to order hand sanitizer pumps, uh, disinfectant wipes, disposable masks at no cost to the departments. And there is, again, a supply request form, I think was mentioned earlier, available on our coronavirus response websites. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And thank you to all of the facilities teams that have been working on campus um, throughout the whole pandemic, working hard to keep our buildings safe throughout um, and ready for us to come back to. So in terms of next steps, I wanna remind everybody that this recording of this webinar and a Q&A document will be posted on the main coronavirus response website um, just as soon as we possibly can following our close here today. We also have reformatted and increased the amount of information and detail that we've been able to provide on the suite of COVID-19 um, web pages. So please take a look at those pages um, and hopefully you'll find a lot of the answers to your questions there. And another reminder, you can send your questions at any time to the coronavirus response at pdx.edu email address. So we'll move now into the um, Q&A portion. I want, there were some questions that came up in the Q&A, the live Q&A that I think, Mike, if you're still with us, I'd love to have you speak to specifically about student vaccination, both um, verification of student vaccinations and the question, can an unvaccinated student be on campus? Mike, are you available to speak to that topic? Hey, Emma. Yeah, I can answer a couple of those things. I mean, we are, uh, student health and counseling is verifying uh, vaccination status of those students who have attested and uh, students are able to take uh, exemptions. And so it's possible for a student to uh, be on campus who's not vaccinated at this point. Uh, they can take a medical or a non-medical exemption. Uh, I think if you look on the uh, dashboard though, you'll see that the, it's a pretty, we have a very high percentage of students who are attesting that they are vaccinated and uh, well over 90% at this point. Sorry, back, back to you, Emma. Great, yes, thank you. Um, was just still looking for the unmute button um, that will maybe never go away for some of us. Mark, this next question is for you, Mark Bajoric. This is a question about someone who has, from someone who has allergies and feels like they are always coughing and sneezing and maybe they can't or people around them can't always tell the difference if maybe we're getting sick. What are some other things they could look for to? that might be an indication that they should stay home and it's not just an allergy. Um, should they be taking their temperature more regularly? Are there COVID signs and symptoms that they should have more at the top of the mind if coughing and sneezing um, is maybe more normal for them? That's pretty rough for that individual, for sure. Um, there have been some new guidelines about people that are infected with the Delta variant. So they may have a degree of coughing um, sneezing is also something to look for. Loss of uh, sensation of smell is still prevalent for both the standard COVID-19 as well as the Delta variant. 
But if you're really worried, please call us. We'll get you a rapid test. It doesn't cost anything to do a rapid test right now. The state is providing free tests to educational settings, so they're available. We can try to schedule it at a time that works for you and usually give you results within that half day. I hope that that answers your question. Thanks, Mark. There were some questions that were added uh, both in the in advance of the webinar and in the chat here about events on campus and how to hold events safely and what kind of events are allowed. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to that. So during the majority of the past year, um, our campus was closed to the public and uh, external events were not allowed on campus. We also had a maximum gathering capacity on campus. Neither of those things are in place anymore. So external events can happen on campus. Uh, um, an external group can rent space at PSU. Um, additionally, maximum gathering sizes have been removed. So you, as we get back to campus, you will see larger events happening. Um, maybe it's 50 people, maybe it's a couple hundred people. And because of the, the pieces that we have in place on campus, the vaccination requirement in our community, masking, ventilation, um, all of those things, um, you know, these events um, are, are being held on campus and can be held safely. There is, um, it, it can be really helpful to plan your event through conferencing and event services, and they can help you um, uh, and recommend some things like a sign-in sheet or ways to communicate with your attendees about behavioral expectations on campus, um, dealing with an event attendee who might not want to wear a mask, or through SELP. The student organizations can work through SELP so that you've got that support for planning your event on campus. But events can be held on campus, um, everything from a meeting with a colleague from a different organization um, to larger events and activities. We will see all of these things happening again on campus. There was a question about, um, does every person need to swipe their ID card before entering a building? As was described, there will be some buildings that have um, uh, public access hours. They will be unlocked, those buildings. Why we are still asking employees to swipe in even if you can open, you know, the door is unlocked and you can open the door to a building is so that if we need to send an email notification about a case of COVID in that was in that building, then we have that data. Um, you might not remember every time, you might not swipe in every time. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a perfect foolproof system, but we want to use the data we have and communicate as much as possible. We also have the dashboards for um, cases and testing on campus. So you can um, see the case rate on campus, which has been very, very low as we've been very, there hasn't been much activity on campus. Um, and so that is a resource for you to know where things are happening as well. Mark, I know you just turned your video off, but I'll ask you to come back just for a moment. There's a question. What is the difference between isolation and quarantine? Sure. And um, I think whoever asked the question, um, you're not alone. We get that asked at least three or four times a day. So um, if somebody tests positive for COVID, they're required to isolate. So positive test means isolate. If someone is exposed um, and um, they haven't been vaccinated, those folks quarantine. And um, I hope that's helpful. So for um, quarantine, you can, test out of quarantining, uh, you can get an initial uh, test and then you can get a test seven days out. And so some of the recommendations where a whole class has um, been exposed to an individual, say they were doing group projects, will encourage that whole group to go ahead and um, stay away from each other for seven days. And that's assuming that probably one of the participants or even two are um, unvaccinated. And so that would be a quarantine as opposed to somebody who actually got the positive test. And we know that they have to isolate away from the general public. Back to you, Emma. Thank you. <clears throat> there have been questions uh, entered that are 
sort of scenario questions. I'm an instructor, someone in my class tests positive. I'm an instructor or um, someone in my household is ill and we want to quarantine. How do we handle this? And I want to draw folks' attention to the um, resource guide on the OAA website. And I put the link in the chat and I'll, I'll drop it in there again. Um, but there is a guide on the faculty resources webpage that has a number of those scenarios identified and talks about how to think through, even now, some options for what to do about instruction that might need to shift because um, an instructor is no longer able to meet in person or a student or a group of students is no longer to be able to be there in person. So I've just added that back to the chat. Take a look there um, to that resource page to walk through some of those scenarios that you might experience in the classroom. Mike, I was wondering if we could ask you again, there have been some questions about mask enforcement in the classrooms. And um, if you could talk through the resources or even um, the points that you're guiding folks with about how to address that situation. Yeah, thanks Emma. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting in the classroom environment uh, as, we, as we get students back who, uh, some of whom might not be used to wearing masks in the, in the environment. So I think the most important thing is up front, or even prior to classes starting, if you're able to, is to email that expectation out. Um, as we all know, I think once we let people know about expectations ahead of time, it's a whole bunch easier to um, address it in the moment. So if you're able to do that in your classroom environment, uh, that's gonna go a long way. Uh, I know that I taught the Summer Bridge course this year and I taught every day. Monday through Thursday for four weeks. Um, and we did put that in as an expectation. And I can report to you that there were zero mask and uh, enforcement complaints from any of the sections of the entire Summer Bridge program. So I just wanna put that out there as good news that um, the 200 or so students that were involved in the Summer Bridge, uh, there were no mask violations or complaints uh, in the classroom. We had some in the residence halls, but not in the classroom. Uh, and so when it comes to enforcement, it's the best, the best practice is to is tell people ahead of time is your expectation. In the moment, um, I really would encourage you to watch that mass video. I don't, I don't want to spend the whole time talking about that mass video. It's about four minutes. It's real short. Um, but the important thing is to try to get the student one-on-one um, -on -one if you're able to do that and have a conversation about wearing the mask. Uh, and if you run into problems, uh, you can you can always refer the student to the Dean of Student Life Office and we can work with you and with the student to help uh, with compliance going forward. We have a number of tools at our disposal to assist you to help make that, uh, make that as safe as possible. So welcome, uh, welcome your emails, walshme at pdx.edu. Also, please watch the mass video as well. Thank you, Mike. Had a question here in the chat. How is PSU implementing the Biden vaccine policy? So the, I believe what is being referenced there is the requirement of employers that have more than 100 employees to um, have a vaccination policy. Nathan, I'm wondering if you could talk about that um, and, and how we're, what we're assessing right now. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Emma. So we, we do see this a lot. Um, we see announcements at maybe the federal or state level uh, that kind of gives you a bullet point or, or you know, a headline of what's going to happen. But in order to implement this uh, through HR and through the institution, we need to actually see what comes out from the regulatory agencies. So in this specific case, uh, we are tracking OSHA, um, so Occupational self uh, Safety and Health, and they are supposedly issuing rules on this or guidance on this in the coming week. After the federal uh, program information is issued, then we anticipate that we will also see some additional details from the state. And those two together give us the ability to act and to implement based on what we hear at the federal and state level. And um, so we're tracking it very closely and we want to ensure that the, the way that we implement this is in line with federal and state guidance. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Nathan. I just want to reiterate, we are um, working as hard as we can to get to all of the 
currently 107 open questions in the Q&A module. We've gotten through about 130. Um, we're not likely to get through everything live here in the webinar, but as we uh, wrap up and when we post this, recording to the website, we will post responses to Q&As, we will make sure that items we're not able to um, get to live, that we include those in the document that's posted. So thank you very much for your patience. I want to turn to um, Heather. Um, if I may now, there was a question, Heather, about where people can find more detail about their specific buildings. We've got, we've talked about MERV 13 filters in, in many buildings, but um, how might they find more specific information about their buildings for COVID safety? Thank you, Emma. There is a web page called PSU Buildings COVID-19 Summary Profile. It is linked from the EHS Air Quality website that was that link was provided in this um, in this presentation. But the PSU Buildings COVID-19 Summary Profile goes building by building and talks about uh, the building HVAC systems. Uh, mask locations and some access control type information and, and so forth. So I, that should provide the information that folks are looking for. And of course, any additional questions can be sent to the coronavirus response email or facility specific questions can be directed to facilities and property management. Thanks, Heather. I see some questions um, being actively answered about technology in the classroom and how an instructor balances recording and um, using the microphone. Jared, if you're not actively typing at this moment, could I ask you to turn your camera back on and um, maybe you sort of provide a little scenario about how an instructor ensures that they've got um, the recording and the amplification just right? Yeah, well, you know, we pretty much built these rooms, as I think I mentioned in one of the answers, uh, with everyone doing all the testing wearing masks. In most cases, amplification isn't necessary to be captured or heard well in the rooms. If you check out our landing page, we do a test in a, not a gigantic room, but in a, in a typical classroom where you can hear the audio quality from a Zoom session um, from various points in the classroom. So in general, it, it works uh, quite well. But that does vary by room. You've all been in different rooms that have different levels of echo and different um, structures. And depending on how many actual physical bodies, backpacks and such are in the room, it, it really changes the dynamics pretty significantly. So we'd recommend that y'all um, go to your first couple class sessions and give it a try. We do have amplification available. We do, you know, there's there's 4,000 instructors. We do not have that many microphones. Um, and if you do want amplification, we can we can get that. A couple of departments are also buying some for their for their units um, to share. Uh, and and that is something we can do. It does, of course, if you clip a piece of technology onto you, is another thing to manage. So again, I think the simplest path forward is uh, give the technology a go. Amplifying yourself and recording or streaming at the same time is not something. That, that we recommend at this time as uh, it may create reverb in the recorded or remote participants environment. We would really recommend you either do a localized amplification for the very large classrooms or in the case you have an instructor who's you know, not able to um, amplify across a given space uh, or reach out to us and, and, and let's have a conversation and figure out uh, maybe there's an easier fix uh, that we can come up with. Sometimes it's just finding a better room that maybe has uh, a little bit different acoustic um, situation going on. So uh, if that's, you know, again, try to stick with P the PA system or the recording streaming. Uh, there's also a couple cool tools for accommodations. If you have like an individual student that has a need or something like that, have them go to the DRC. There's a accommodation process there where we can also come up with other uh, options. And we have in some rooms, a closed circuit, a personal amplification system where uh, the student that has um, an issue hearing uh, can 
can actually receive a specialized amplifier for them. Uh, lots of different ways that that goes forward. Um, but again, the best is to, to get in there, give it a whirl, see how it goes, test the room out ahead of time if you can get in here in the next couple of weeks. Um, but once you go live in the room, you're scheduled in with people in it uh, is really when you're going to get used to it. Um, and we'll, we'll be here. Thank you, Jared. There were have been a couple of questions in the chat about eating and drinking and the mask policy. Are employees allowed to remove masks to eat and drink in communal work areas? Yes, when actively eating. This is um, what we see in the state policy as well about masks. It's just not possible to eat through the mask. Um, I think you know people can take advantage of the nice weather while we have it um, and find um, find places to be, um, but it is allowable um, to have the mask off to eat or drink, um, as well as there are several exceptions for certain activities like swimming that is dangerous to have a mask on while you're in the water. So um, you may see certain activities on campus that um, are allowed to occur without masks. There is a, an exception in the state guidelines for masking that masks can be removed when um, performing or public speaking. And so for um, events on campus, if you have a speaker, a lecture series, something like that, um, uh, if this panel was in person, the way that that is managed is that when the individual is speaking, they would remove their mask. Um, and then when they are done to put the mask on, um, there is a, a recommendation for distance between the podium and the, and the guests and things like that. It's one of the reasons why we really recommend if you can to work through conference and events, to work through SALP if it's a student group, um, to, to get that guidance on, on how to have the event safely. There have been a couple questions about PSU ID cards for getting a card, getting cards replaced. ID card services in the FMH building can provide a replacement for cards. Um, and that building does have public unlocked hours, so you can get in there without a card um, and, and update your card there. There are some questions in here about uploading verification. Um, Nathan, for employees, could you speak to that, please? Apologies, Emma. I was just replying to some questions in the Q&A. Could you rephrase for me, please? Absolutely, yep. We've had some questions about um, proof of vaccination for employees. Could you talk about how that is, how that, how that information would be handled by human resources? Yeah, so we have put together an audit program and so we can audit uh, employee vaccination attestations. We believe that that's important. We do think uh, we have been preparing to send out additional information on that. We are somewhat concerned in tracking that uh, OSHA guidance that is coming out in the next week as that may change our approach. And what we don't want to do is to request information multiple times from employees. And so you should anticipate seeing that information shortly, but it absolutely is a thing and you will hear more in the near future. Thanks, Nathan. And as a reminder, Mike has already mentioned that students who have attested, um, there is a, a verification and audit process for um, that information as well. So um, a couple folks have asked again, if the building and office does not require card access, um, what will contact tracing be based off of? We're asking employees to continue to um, swipe their card on that card reader pad um, when they are approaching the building. Uh, Brian, I see that you're still with us. I'm wondering if I could ask you to um, speak to the question about criteria used to determine 
the possibility of going back to remote? Um, where do we take our cues from when we're looking at that issue? Sure, I was just typing an answer to that, but I'll do it this way and apologize. I'm now out of witness protection. Sorry earlier for the, uh, the issues on my lighting. Um, so there's no magic metric there. Um, this is um, something where we're constantly working with both Multnomah County Health Department, the Oregon Health Authority, and others to determine how we should proceed. I think it's exceedingly unlikely that we'd be required to go back to fully remote or that it would be a necessary in our own uh, judgment to go back to fully remote. Um, but anything's possible. We have uh, certainly um, seen the unexpected in this pandemic. That would be a decision that would be made, again, in consultation with those public health experts, with our internal public health experts, with our operational experts. If we don't think that we can continue to provide a safe environment on campus with in-person instruction, we would pivot. Thank you, Brian. Um, Let's see, I'm looking for maybe some new questions, new topics that we haven't had yet. Um, um, there's a lot about contact tracing, so we'll get some more um, resources up on that website, more scenarios um, that folks can, can use to uh, answer those questions. Um, so more about who the public health experts are. Um, we look to a lot of different sources. We work very closely with Multnomah County Public Health. Um, we work very closely with the state of Oregon Health Authority. We um, are looking at the CDC, um, we're reading all the same news that you are, um, and we are connecting with our other colleges and universities, not just in Oregon, but around the country. What are the best practices? Um, there is the, um, the professional organizations and industry standards that we're looking at in the uh, facilities realm, ASHRAE for, the, for building uh, health and safety, um, the medical community, uh, college public, uh, college health association, um, all of that. Um, we really try to pull in as many sources as possible um, and make uh, science-based uh, informed decisions through this very complicated time. Um, additionally, we, uh, we have to respond to regulations that come down. Um, so that might be from OSHA, as we mentioned earlier, in regards to, um, employers and what is required of employers, um, and it, or it could be from the state or the county imposing a restriction of some kind or a requirement of some kind. And sometimes those don't always match, so there is some untangling we have to do. Um, so we look at a lot of information to um, make these decisions and to build a safe campus environment and robust policies. So we're just a little bit past the hour. Um, we've gotten through uh, a momentous number of questions, um, more than 160 questions we've answered in the Q&A. Um, there are still a number of open questions, but I think we're gonna need to wrap it up for today. So again, I wanna reiterate, um, first of all, thank you for your time. Thank you for investing in this. Thank you for um, being curious um, about being back on campus and we will get the video of this webinar posted online just as soon as we possibly can, as well as um, Q&A information referring to the scenarios. Um, in that will be the links that we've provided. Um, you can also go to the main PSU webpage to the top level coronavirus uh, COVID-19 link and see all of that cascade of, of websites there, the whole suite of websites that we've been mentioning today. So you can find um, question, find the answers um, to your questions there. So I wanna thank everyone for your time. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you very much to the AV support team and our live captioner for being with us and supporting this um, 